special introduction. <laughs> Thank you to Joanna and Tabitha and Grace and just for making us feel so welcome and we have been so blessed by our time with you uh, just so far at the FIBA conference. Both Grace and I are really enjoying it, really honored to be here, uh, really excited about what the Lord is doing in this group and um, in the young ladies, the ones that we've been talking with so far. So we're just really honored to be here. Thank you for inviting us. And uh, this session is on the topic of speaking truth in your heart, which is actually the latest book that Grace was just holding up there. And um, before I kind of get into the session, we have a family ministry and we send out an email newsletter every so often, like every other month or so, with a little devotional, usually by my dad, and kind of updates and prayer requests on our ministry. And if any of you would like to receive that, I'm going to have Grace pass around a couple clipboards, and um, you can just sign your email address if you would be interested in receiving that email newsletter. You can easily unsubscribe too if you join it and don't want any more emails coming in. So, and then could we just pray one more time? as we are starting and just committing this session to the Lord. Father, we are so thankful to you for your great love, your reckless love, your unconditional love for us. And thank you for how much you love every mom and daughter in this room. And thank you for bringing us together for this really special conference. Lord, we ask that you would work here. We just pray right now against the enemy in the name and blood of Jesus. Lord, we know he is a liar. He is the father of lies, and he hates the truth. And so we just pray that he would have no place here, and we pray that your spirit would be at work in every single one of our hearts and lives, that we would be open to you, that we would be sensitive, that we would be ready to hear and to obey and to live our lives for you. And I pray, Lord, that you would use these girls and these moms, just mightily for your kingdom, as you're doing, but just so much more, be using them for you. And I pray that um, you would help all of us to just be focused on you and your word in this session. And we commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, tomorrow, the Grace and I have been asked to share a little bit more about our ministries. And so this session is, I'm going to be teaching this one. So you probably won't hear from Grace, my sister, till tomorrow when we share a little bit more about our ministries and some of the things that God has done in leading us to this place. Um, the Bright Lights ministry, which Grace had mentioned before, it is a discipleship ministry just really encouraging girls to live their lives for the Lord, encouraging them that, you know, the years of their youth can be great years for the Lord and challenging them not to go the world's way, but to 
follow the path that God has for them and follow his word. And so as I've been working with many girls in the Bright Lights ministry for many years, I'm always learning right along with them. And a few years ago, I started writing some material for these girls in the Bright Lights groups, specifically on the topic of lies and truths. And I just knew, you know, it was an important topic. And what are some common lies we believe? And how can we replace those lies with truth? Well, the more I worked on it, this, the, what I was writing, the more I was challenged, the more I was learning, the more I was then sharing it with girls and the response I was getting from them, I was just realizing, wow, this topic is a lot more important than I even realized. There's so many girls and, so, and all of us, we don't realize the lies that we're believing or even the ones that we're repeating to ourselves, even if we don't we're telling ourselves we don't believe them, but we're thinking them, and it's impacting us. And so I began to be more and more challenged and convinced about the importance of this topic, which is why I ended up writing that book, Speak Truth in Your Heart, and which I'm really excited to share some things with, with you in this session. Just because as we think about this generation that we're in, just we, as we've been hearing about, it's like the days of Noah, and praying, especially for you younger girls in this room, that you would be bright lights in this dark generation, which just seems like it just keeps getting darker. And there is an enemy. And one of his tactics against us that we know from his word is lies. He is a liar. He is the father of lies. And we need to be so well grounded in the truth of God's word. And I think so many girls just don't even realize that they're believing lies and they have no idea how those lies are actually impacting them in their everyday lives. And that's why we need to replace those lies with the truth and realize that um, as Christian girls, the Lord is calling us to be bright lights in this world. We don't need to be overcome by our culture. We don't need to go along with the ways and the thinkings of the world. And so many Christian girls, you know, if you ask them how they're doing, they're kind of like, oh, I'm fine. But inwardly, it's like they're screaming for help, so many of them. And so many of them are just really struggling, some of them failing, some of them walking away from the faith, and some of them so just dealing so much with their own issues that it's like, well, how can they even be, go and be a bright light and share the gospel and reach the world for Christ? They can barely even get through this day on their own just because of their own issues. And, you know, that's not, that's not what God has called us to as Christians. I mean, yes, we're in a war, and yes, we're going to face struggles every day, but he's called us to victory in everyone in this room and our young ladies and you girls who are teenagers here. And I really like this verse in Psalm chapter 1. Verses one and two, blessed is the man or the girl whose delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, she meditates day and night. She'll be like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither. Whatever she does, she prospers. That's the kind of Christian that we can be. And just like Micah was sharing this morning, Christians are going to bear fruit. And if we are abiding in God's word, and if we are like that tree planted by the streams of water, we are going to be bringing forth fruit, prospering, bearing fruit in season. And that's something really exciting. And we need to be aware that that's exactly what the enemy does not want. And that's why he wants to keep us from God's word, and he wants to blind us with lies. Now, I find that a lot of Christian girls, it's like they have their things that they're struggling with, and they just, they keep struggling with the same things over and over. And maybe some of you can relate to this. You've got some things in your life that are hard, but you just like, it's like this continuing struggle over and over, the same struggles. And I think that often happens because we're only focusing on the, um, the surface issues and we're not getting down deeper. Like maybe we're just dealing with the actions, but we're not getting to the wrong thinking behind the actions. We're not dealing with the actual lies that we're believing. We're just trying to fix the problem. And so as a result, because we're not taking care of the root problem, the lies that we're believing, we just keep having the same struggles over and over and the enemy just keeps getting us. And we're not walking in that victory and bearing all that fruit that God intends us to bear. So that's really what I want us to focus on in this session. How do we learn to get down deep, identify lies, and replace them with God's word? Imagine that you walk into your kitchen and it's white, your, your kitchen floor is white and clean. 
except you notice that someone has just walked through with mud on their shoes and they've left this track of muddy footprints. So you get out your mop and you wash the kitchen floor and now it's all sparkly and white again, but you look out the front door and you realize that right outside the door is a big pile of mud. And so a few minutes later, your little brother comes running inside. He comes running through that big pile of mud. He comes running through the front door, through the kitchen. And once again, you have this pile of, of this, this, these muddy footprints. So of course, you get out your mop and you clean it up again and you have it nice and sparkly and clean and then your little dog, he comes running through. And once again, through the mud, then right into the kitchen. And you get out the mop, you clean it again, but a few hours later, your dad comes home from work, he walks through the mud, through the front door, the kitchen floor is uh, full of muddy footprints again. Okay, you're gonna be cleaning up <laughs> muddy footprints the rest of your life unless you do what? You can say it out real loud. What do you have to do? Yes, you've got to get rid of the mud. Like, if you don't take care of the mud pile, you're just going to be cleaning up messes. And I think that's often what we do in our lives. We're just cleaning up the mess, cleaning up the mess, rather than taking care of the cause. If we would clean up that mud outside the door, we wouldn't have to keep <laughs> mopping the kitchen floor every, every hour. And you know, if you're out weeding in your garden, everyone knows it doesn't work very well just to pull the tops off of the weeds. You gotta get down to the root. So that's what we wanna do in our lives. So how might that play out in a girl's life? Well, let's just say this girl here, she's Carly. And as she's looking in the mirror before she's going to her friend's birthday dinner, she's complaining and she's saying, I just wish I could get my hair to look like Megan's hair. So she's complaining. And you know, what comes out of our mouth is really an overflow of the beliefs in our heart. So it doesn't seem like a big deal. I mean, it's just a small thing, but she is just complaining about her appearance. So maybe she's saying, you know, I wish that I could look like so-and-so. And by the way, if you can't read the little diagrams on here, these same diagrams are in the book, Speak Truth in Your Heart, plus a lot more of them, so you can uh, look at them there later. Um, now, really, Carly, she is actually believing a lie that lots of girls believe. She's believing, you know, my value in the eyes of others is dependent on how I look. Uh, being beautiful is what's going to make me happy or accepted. Now, that's not what God's Word says. Proverbs 31 says that favor is deceitful, beauty is vain, but the woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. But Carly's not thinking about God's Word right now. She's thinking about her hair and how she looks and how Megan looks, and so she's discouraged. Now, her sister comes along and gives her some encouragement and says, Carly, your hair is beautiful just the way it is. I love your thick hair. And it makes Carly feel a little bit better, and that's great, but that's not actually taking care of the root lie that she's believing. And so, when uh, a couple of weeks later on Sunday, when her friend is designing a brochure and needs to do a photo shoot, and she asks Megan to be in the photo shoot, and she doesn't ask Carly, all of these thoughts start coming again. It's because I don't look good enough. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not good enough. And really what she's saying is like, God made a mistake when he made me. You know, if she really believes that, he, that she's, doesn't, she's not beautiful enough, well, God's the one who created her. And her sister comes along again and says, oh, don't feel bad they, that you're not on the photo shoot, they, they, on the brochure, they could only pick one person anyway, and starts to encourage her again, but again, doesn't deal with the root issue. And so the next weekend when there's a wedding, Meg, or Carly, she's trying to decide what to wear, and so she finally just picks something out of her closet, and when she gets to the wedding, she's looking around at what everyone else is wearing, and she's thinking, everyone else looks so stylish and so put together. I knew I should have gone shopping before this wedding. She feels discouraged about her appearance, and she kind of misses all the opportunities that she could have had to be encouraging people at the wedding and have some encouraging conversations because she's just focused on herself. She's discouraged for the weekend. And so this is like a reoccurring problem for Carly, but really what she's believing, like really deep down, what Carly's really saying in her heart is she's saying, well, God is not trustworthy because if she really thinks that God made a mistake when he made her, then really she's not believing that God is faithful and that God is trustworthy and that she can trust him in every single area of her life. Now, Carly is not, 
going around saying to her friends, God is not trustworthy. But in essence, that's what the, the, she's believing in her heart. And it keeps creating this discouragement, this struggle for her. Okay, here's another girl, Jessa. When she moves to a new town, um, she is really worried that she's not going to have any friends. So when they visit a new church and an older girl named Talitha comes up and welcomes Jessa and is really kind to her, it means the world to Jessa, especially because Talitha is, seems like super popular and fun and um, and everyone seems to really like Talitha. And now Jessa is thinking, finally, I'm going to have a best friend. Finally, we're going to do everything together. Finally, I'm going to be happy. And so she's also believing a lie. She's believing that a good friend is what's going to fulfill her and what's going to make her happy. And she hasn't realized yet that friends are always going to let us down. People are always going to let us down. And so a few Sundays later, when they had a special speaker at church and Jess's friends, uh, or, and Talitha invited a few friends to go out for ice cream and talk about the special speaker and didn't invite Jessa. Jessa walk, watched them walk out without her and she felt very hurt and then a little bit resentful and then very alone. And all these thoughts started coming again to her about how discouraged she was. Well then, Jessa, uh, Talitha texted her a few days later just to say, how are you doing? And would you like to come to the New Year's Eve party coming up? And so then uh, Jessa's feeling more encouraged again. But then the next Sunday at church, she sees Talitha and her other friend Ella kind of laughing off together in the hallway, and she feels left out again. And so it's this continuing struggle for Jessa. So maybe it looks something like this. I think Talitha likes Ella more than she likes me. A good friend is what's going to make me happy and secure. So having a good friend is what I should be striving for. But what she's really saying in her heart is, well, Jesus' friendship doesn't fully satisfy. I need something else too. God's not really enough for me. Now again, Jessa is not going around telling people God is not enough for me. But it's really what she's believing in her heart. And it's impacting all these decisions. And so maybe she's trying to just clean up the kitchen floor by getting encouraged with friends. But that's not taking care of the root problem. Now, if Jessa would instead speak the truth in her own heart, if she would say, you know what? Jesus is enough for me. If she would say, he's all I need, and my heart is satisfied in him, well, then she would be able to say, you know, pleasing Jesus is what really matters. And he says it's more blessed to give than to receive. And then she'd be able to say, well, thank you, Lord, for Talitha, and help me to encourage her just as she encouraged me. And then she might say, you know what? A new girl is visiting church. I should go welcome her. Now, do you see the difference in the first Jessa and the second Jessa? In the first one, we have a discouraged girl who is just thinking of herself and ending up being a burden and a, kind of a drain to the people around her because she is needing attention. And then in the second example, we have this girl who's joyfully reaching out to others and impacting her church for the Lord. And it's all because of what she's choosing to believe in her heart. And so just like when we believe lies, it has a whole string of consequences. So when we really believe the truth, when we think the truth, when we speak it to ourselves, there's a whole string of blessings, not only for us, but for the people around us. And, you know, our mind is a battlefield. And if you're a Christian, um, then that battlefield, so let's just say this is, this is our mind right here, okay? It's a battlefield. If we're a Christian, it belongs to Jesus. This is his territory because we belong to him. So there's an enemy and he wants to attack. And he attacks with lies with all kinds of wrong thoughts, distracting thoughts, impure thoughts. But one of the big lies, wrong thoughts he brings are lies. Now, if we think that, well, it's just what I'm thinking in my mind, it's not really a big deal. It's kind of like we're just letting the enemy come right into our territory and just hang out there. I mean, if we think I'm not really doing anything wrong, I'm just thinking something wrong. It's not really that big of a deal. That's kind of like letting the bad guy into your territory and just letting him be. Is he just going to sit there and do nothing? No. He's going to stir up trouble. He's going to invite more. He's going to build a stronghold right there in your territory if you just let him go unchecked. So when wrong thoughts come into our mind, we need to, as 2 Corinthians says, take them captive into the obedience of Jesus Christ. So we need to learn to identify those wrong thoughts 
And how do we do that? Well, we need to see if they align with God's word. If a thought is not consistent with God's word, well, then we know it is not truth. (laughs) And so that lie needs to go. That wrong thought needs to go. We can't just let it stay and let ourselves dwell on it. We have to get rid of it. But here's the thing. You can't really just like push out all the wrong thoughts out of your mind. Like it just doesn't work that way. That's kind of like waking up in the morning and pushing all the darkness out of your bedroom. Well, that's not what you do. You get up in the morning and you turn on the light, right? You turn on the light, the darkness flees. And that's what happens with the truth. When we flood our mind with the truth of God's word, then there's no place for those lies. That cleanses out the lies. So that's what we want to be doing. We want to learn to fill our minds with the truth. And I really like this verse. It says, Lord, who shall abide in your tabernacle? Who will dwell in your holy hill? He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. That phrase is where I got the title for my new book. Speak the truth in your heart. That's what we want to do. But but what does that mean? (laughs) I mean, we all know what it is to like speak the truth to our friends. Like it means to be truthful in what we say. But how do we speak the truth to ourselves? Well, there's one godly preacher and he says, every day before he preaches the gospel to others, first of all, he preaches it to himself. Because he said he needs to remind himself every day of what Jesus has done for him and how great his salvation is. As he, te- as he reminds himself of that truth, he is uh, prepared, fresh and new to share it with others. So that would be an example of speaking the truth to ourselves, reminding ourselves of the truth from God's word. The problem is that we often do the opposite. Uh, Like a friend of mine, I'll just call her Stephanie. When she was like 10 or 11, she came to one of our Bright Lights conferences. And she had already trusted in Christ as her Savior. And um, she was really wanting to grow in the Lord. And she made a decision that she wanted to start reading God's Word every day. And she was doing that. And as a 10-year-old, an 11-year-old, a 12-year-old, she was really growing in Christ. Well, then a trial hit. It was when her parents started having problems in their marriage. And there had been problems all along, but they really got worse. And there was a lot of anger and fighting and bitterness going on in her home. And Stephanie couldn't stand it. She just hated it. And she just wanted God to get her out of that situation. And she just prayed and said, Lord, change my parents. Just keep their marriage together, but change them. And and she was praying and asking God to do that. Well, instead of things getting better, things with her parents were just getting worse. And Stephanie finally thought, you know what? God's not taking care of my problem, so I can't really trust him anymore. So I'm going to just have to to take matters in my own hands. And she made the decision that she, well, it started with her allowing these thoughts. Like, "If, if God really loved me, like, why would he be allowing this? And she said that she couldn't really reconcile the fact that God loved her with the fact that God was allowing a lot of pain in her life. And so what started as these little questions like, why is God doing this? Why isn't God answering my prayer? Does God even care about us and our family and our situation? What started as those little thoughts became like this deeply rooted lie in her heart that she was believing about who God was until she came to the point where she made a decision that I'm just not going to trust God anymore. And she stopped reading his word. She stopped praying. She stopped having any kind of relationship. She just like cut off her relationship with God. She was still walking around acting like a nice Christian girl. But in her heart, she was in darkness. She was not having fellowship with the Lord. And that started just this miserable year for her of depression and rebellion and all kinds of, all kinds of struggles because the one person who could help her through that trial the one person who was there for her, who did love her. He is the high priest who can sympathize with us in our weaknesses. He doesn't promise to immediately take the pain away, but he cares, and he carries us in the midst of that pain. And the one person that she could run to to for help, she was running away from. And that caused more misery than she ever would have imagined. And it wasn't until she came to the place where she repented of those lies that she had been believing about God that she was then able to forgive her parents and others and get on the right track again, seeking the Lord. And now she is living for the Lord and has a bright testimony for him, um, even though last I heard her situation with her parents hasn't improved yet. And so we wanna be so careful about what are those thoughts we allow? 
because what starts small is going to grow in our heart. And you know, there's lots of scripture that talks about how what's in our heart is linked to our actions. Like Psalm 119.11, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Or Matthew 12, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Or Romans 12, be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So if we want to be transformed, how does that happen? By the renewing of our mind. So our thinking has to be aligned with God's thinking as in his word so that our heart can then be transformed. I was talking to a guy um, at a a secular conference, and we were there having a kind of evangelism outreach and kind of talked to to people who are there, unbelievers who are there, and he was a uh, public school teacher. And um, I was asking him a little bit about what he believed, and he said, well, I just believe whatever my heart tells me to believe. And I said, well, we need a more reliable foundation than that for our lives because, you know, the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and it's desperately wicked. And he says, oh, my heart has never led me astray. And I said, well, there's people that might think that they're doing the right thing, like Hitler. He might have believed he was doing the right thing when he was killing all the Jews or terrorists who blow people up. They might think that they're doing the right thing, but that doesn't make it right. The Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. And he said, you know what? He's like, my Mormon friends tell me one thing. My Jehovah Witness friends tell me another thing. You tell me another thing. That's why I just believe my heart. Whatever my heart tells me to believe. And I said, but the thing is our hearts can be flawed. And he said, my heart has been 100% right 100% of the time. It's never led me astray. And it really shocked me that he actually claimed that. But it was so sad that really was what he was basing his whole life, his whole worldview, his whole thinking on was his own heart. And we all know our heart is not a reliable source of truth. I mean, if we, we need a foundation for our lives that is 100% true 100% of the time, and we all know that the only thing that fits that category is God's word that he's given us. And without this, we are going to be like a tree without roots or a house without a foundation or an explorer without a compass um, or a ship without an anchor. We need a foundation for our lives. And so we need to be getting to know God's word, getting to know it well, because Satan's lies are tricky. He mixes a little bit of truth with a little bit of lie, and it makes the lies more believable. Some of the lies sound very close to the truth. That way, that's why we need to know what God has actually said so that we can identify those lies that come against us. Now, I want to take a few minutes and go through some common lies that we might believe. These are just kind of some basic ones. Um, this, if you want to study this more, you can definitely go through, like, a, there's quite a list of lies and truths in the book, Speak Truth in Your Heart. I think the first thing that Satan wants, us, wants to attack us in is what I was just telling you in the story of Stephanie is our understanding of God. He does not want us to know who our God is. And we see that when he was talking to Eve in the Garden of Eden. He wanted her to doubt God's words and to doubt that God was really being good to her. Um, So, you know, he wants us to think kind of like in Stephanie's situation. God doesn't really care about me, looking at our circumstances. Now, whenever we we find ourselves believing a lie, we should combat that lie with the truth. And there's lots of truths that could combat this lie. I like 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care on him because he cares for you. I received a phone call from a girl, I'll just call her Naomi, and she had said that uh, she had some questions for me. She was about 15 years old and kind of shy, and we were talking on the phone and just chatting, and she wasn't really asking me any of her questions. And so then I said, well, was there something you wanted to ask me? And then all of a sudden she got real, like, quiet and awkward and started kind of stumbling around with her words and not knowing what to say. And so I figured she was kind of embarrassed to ask her question. And then finally she's like, well, she's like, how do I know if God loves me? And I said, Naomi, I'm glad you're willing to ask that question. A lot of girls, you know, I think have that question and are not really willing to express it. And I said, well, I said, do you know the children's song? 
Jesus loves me, this I know. And I said, what comes next? And she said, for the Bible tells me so. <laughs> and I said, yes, for the Bible tells us so. That's why how we know God's love is from his word. And she said, well, I just wish I could know for sure that he loved me. Like, if he loves me, how come he won't do a little miracle for me? Like, it would be so easy for him to do a miracle for me, and then I would know that he loved me. And I said, well, Naomi, what miracle has God already done for you to show you his love? And she didn't answer me, so I waited. And she's like, well, he sent Jesus to die for me. <laughs> and I said, yes, Naomi, he sent Jesus to die for you. What could be a greater miracle? What could be a greater demonstration of God's love? And I opened up my Bible to Romans 8, even though I was on the phone with her, but I was reading Romans 8 to her about how nothing can separate us from God's love and that God demonstrates his love to us in this while we were still sinners. Christ died for us, Romans 5, 8. And so, um, and then Naomi said to me, she's like, but I just wish I could know for sure. And I said, Naomi, you can know for sure. I said, sometimes people ask me a question and I can only tell them, well, this is my advice in your situation. I, I can't always say it yes or no. But I said, Naomi, I can tell you yes, because God word, God's word assures us of his love for us. And it was really sad because at the end of the conversation, she still didn't sound very convinced. And I think similar to Stephanie, she started having this doubt in her heart whenever something would go wrong. Does God really love me? Does God really care for me? And what started that as that little seed of doubt and question, because she didn't replace it with truth, had become now this deeply rooted lie in her heart. Now, we can't think that just if we've got this deeply rooted lie in our heart, that we can just quote one scripture verse one time and that lie is going to be gone. No. Satan is going to probably keep bringing that lie against us, especially if we've already repeated that lie to ourselves a hundred times. So it might take a hundred times of just repeating truth to ourselves. That's what meditation on scripture is. It's thinking about God's word and thinking about it again and thinking about it again and engrafting it in our hearts. But we are in a war. We do not want to give up because God's word is going to, is much greater than that lies of the enemy. Um, here's another similar one. Well, if God really loved me, such and such would not have happened. A friend of mine was really struggling with this one. When she was a teenager, her family went on the mission field to a jungle area, a remote area, and while she was there, something really terrible happened to her. And she, she was saying to God, why? Why did you allow this? How could this, th this isn't good. How could this possibly be good? God, you could have protected me and you didn't protect me. We only came here on the mission field to serve you. We didn't come here for fun. We came here to serve you. And then you allowed this to happen to me? And she really fell into uh, depression and fear. And she said it wasn't until she realized that she doesn't have to understand all the truth to choose to believe the truth. But when she chose that she would believe God's word, when God says in Romans 8, 32, that all things work together, or 828, sorry, all things work together for good for those who love him. She didn't have to understand all of that. She didn't have to understand her whole situation. She could choose to believe his word anyway. And that's what she did. And it was like light came flooding into her soul. And she is now one of the most joyful people I know serving the Lord. And I like this verse, the mountains shall depart, the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from you. Another lie about God. Well, I keep asking God, but he's not listening to me. Well, scripture says the Lord hears the prayers of the righteous. And uh, we won't spend a lot of time on this one, but you know, if the enemy can get us to believe that prayer doesn't really make a difference, that prayer is a waste of time, prayer doesn't change anything anyway, God's not hearing us, well, then we're going to probably stop praying. And if we stop praying, we've just lost one of our greatest tools, weapons against the enemy. And so we need to remember the truth about who our God is and that he hears and answers prayer. And, you know, if you told me that your next door neighbor stole your bicycle out of your garage, well, I would believe you. I would say, oh, I'm so sorry that happened to you. But if you told me that my sister Grace stole your bicycle out of your garage, I would say, I'm sorry, there must be some mistake because I know my sister Grace and she would never do that. She's very honest. So I don't know what happened, but it, it couldn't have been Grace because I know Grace. And so I'm not going to just believe anything I hear about her. So you see, we need to get to know God 
And we do that through his word. Get to know his names, get to know his character, get to know who he is, so that we're not quickly believing the lies that people say about him. You know, I remember being on the phone with a, a lady just diagnosed with cancer, and she had been Muslim, and she was just a brand new Christian. And it was like, why? she just turned to Christ and now he's letting this happen to her and she didn't understand and she was sobbing and I just remember telling her like I don't know like why but I said we know who our God is and we can trust him and it was really sweet as a new believer for her to be able to say yes we know who God is and to trust him in that trial when I was um oh about 15 I remember one day the Christmas Christmas, it was Christmas time and all the Christmas cards were arriving at our house. And my mom said to me, Sarah, look at the Christmas cards. Look at the one from Mr. Wilson. So I looked at the card from Mr. Wilson and he had this little challenge for me and then my younger brother, Stephen, and my younger sister, Grace. And the challenge was he gave us 10 attributes of God, like God is righteous, God is holy, God is good, God is omnipresent, God is omnipotent. And so there were 10 of them. And each one had a description explaining what righteousness is, what sovereignty is, what love is. And so he said he wanted us to memorize them, all 10 of them and all the definitions. And he wanted us to memorize them so well that our parents could ask us at three random times to, uh, and to be able to tell them the attributes. And um, if we did, then he was going to give us a prize. And I think it was like a gift certificate to McDonald's or something like that. So we all did it. We did the, the activity, we memorized them, and we re kept reviewing them so that we would know them when my parents asked us. And I remember at that same time thinking, you know, each morning when I have my own quiet time with the Lord, just my time in the Word, I want to pick one of those attributes and just really focus on it and really pray about it. And so I would like pick, for example, God is just for one morning. And I would just spend a few minutes praying, like thanking God for his justice and thinking about what does that really mean that God is just and how does that affect me? And thank you, Lord, that you can justly forgive me because of Jesus' sacrifice. So it just spent a few minutes on it. And I remember that at that, right at that season of my life, it's like my prayers no longer just became about me. It was about who God is. Like I was getting to know God better. And my time of worship, what I found was such a like important part of my prayer time. And I remember thinking about how like when we have those sweet moments in worship, doesn't have to be a lot of music, doesn't have to be anyone else, just silent worship, thinking about who God is. It just makes our heart sing for joy and soar because we are um, getting that little taste, that little glimpse of more of who God is. So we want to get to know God better and better so that we can re reject and recognize those lies of the enemy. Now, when we have a right understanding about God, and obviously there's so much more, <laughs> but this is just this is just quick. Then we can have the right perspective about ourself. And this is one that a lot of girls really struggle with. So when I started writing that Bright Lights material about lies and truths, I sent an email to a bunch of Bright Lights leaders and I said, could you share testimonies with me of lies that you have believed and how God has helped you with those lies so that I can share them and, and use them as in my material? So I started getting a lot of emails with a lot of these little stories of just girls sharing honestly lies they believed. And I started categorizing them. So I put like, okay, these are all the lies about God. These are lies about sin. These are lies about purity and relationships. These are lies about ourself. These are so I just categorized them. So by far the most common topic that I was getting were lies about ourself. So many girls really struggle with, they just feel very discouraged about themselves and inadequate and it's like, you know, Satan, he's not only a liar, he's an accuser. We see that in Revelation, right? He's an accuser and he wants to pull us down. He doesn't want us to remember who we are in Christ. So. Here's a few examples of some of the lies, some of the things that girls sent me. One girl, she was actually in Australia. She said this, For most of my life, I felt that I had to work hard to earn people's approval and even God's approval. However, I found that the more I tried to be good enough in my own strength, the more I failed. And the more I failed, the more I felt condemned for my failures. I took my eyes off Jesus and his work in me, forgot my true identity in him, and believed this destructive lie. At times, I couldn't pray because of the weight of guilt on my shoulders from not measuring up. I was not living in victory. 
Another girl said that she believed the lie that nothing I have to say is important. And so this would keep her from like public speaking or sharing in small groups and cause her to miss opportunities that she could have encouraged others in the Lord. Another girl told me that she struggled with blaming herself for everything, even things that were not her fault. She said that she couldn't have joy because even if she started out the day feeling happy, she would soon begin to blame herself for all the bad things that happened. Um, one girl told me that she believed she wasn't good enough, pretty enough, smart enough, and as she continued to believe these lies, she faced a struggle that she never thought she would, and that is an eating disorder. And she said it was really hard for her to uh, admit that she, a Christian girl, was struggling with an eating disorder, and that it really started because she wasn't guarding her thoughts. So there's all kinds of lies that come like this one. I am worthless and insignificant. Well, Scripture says God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created him. And then in the New Testament, as his church, the Lord says, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time were not the people, but now are the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So as believers, we have been given a very privileged position in Christ. He has given us exceeding great worth. Not because of who we are, but because of who he is. And I think we need to be really careful about this one because the world also has advice for girls who are discouraged about themselves. And the world comes along and says, you are great, just be you, just like you are. Find your inner beauty. Look in the mirror, just tell yourself how beautiful you are, just how amazing you are. And these are the kinds of words of self-esteem that the world is telling young ladies to believe. Well, that is not the answer for discouragement about ourselves. Because number one, that's not the truth. We're not so great. The more we look at ourselves, the more we find that we're sinners, that we fall short of God's standards, that we are undeserving. I mean, the more we grow as a Christian, that actually we find ourselves to be worse than we even knew. So our hope and our joy and all our encouragement is not gonna come in speaking these words of self-esteem and trying to, like, if we're just trying to like build girls up by telling them how great they are, well, that's kind of like a pain pill that maybe just makes them feel a little bit better for a while, but doesn't really take care of the problem. That's not where their hope is going to be found. In fact, if their security is being found in hearing good things about themselves, then what about when those good words aren't coming anymore? Their security just falls away. So that's not where our security is. The security for them and for us is realizing our position as a new person in Christ. And so just like this little picture of Remembering that God sees us. If we're a Christian, if we've trusted in Christ to save us, God sees us now as in Christ. And God has, um, the righteousness of Jesus has actually been given to us. And we have this position of being in Christ. And the truth is, we might not be lovely, but we're loved. We might fail and disappoint God and other people, but we're accepted in Christ. We might not be a supermodel according to the standards of this world, but we're beautiful to God in Christ. We might not be as talented as someone else, but we are uniquely equipped to do what God has called us to do. And after all, God loves to use the weak, the humble, the small, the inadequate to do his great mighty work, and then he gets all the glory. And he has called us to do these great and mighty things. I was riding in the car with a girl, I'll just call her Susanna. We had kind of a long car trip together, so we had plenty of time to talk. And she was sharing with me that every time she failed as a Christian, she really started to doubt God's love for her. And she just, like, whenever she would struggle and find herself not measuring up to what she knew she should measure up, she just really felt, um, just her relationship with the Lord, she just, I don't know, almost like forsaken. And the more we talked about this, the more I just realized, wow, this has been a really big struggle for this girl. And so then I said to her, I said, well, like if there's a pa godly parent and they have two kids and one of them is being really um, sweet and kind and obedient and one's being like really rebellious and difficult, do you think the parents would probably love like the obedient one more than the rebellious one? She said, no. She's like, I know they would love them both the same. She's like, it's just me and my situation that I start doubting God's love for me. Well, that's a really dangerous way to think because it makes God's love dependent on us and God's love is not dependent on us. Now, I think that maybe that where this causes confusion for a lot of girls is that they 
um, you know, God's love for us is unconditional, but we can please God by the way we live our lives. And that would be called our practical righteousness. So here's another picture. So this first one would be like our positional righteousness, but the second one would be like our practical righteousness. So this is a girl just living out her daily Christian life. She's saying no to sin. She's saying yes to Jesus. She's serving other people. So by the way we choose to live our lives, we can please God or we can displease God. When we choose to displease God, that hinders our fellowship with God. Our fellowship is not as close. Our relationship is not as sweet and as close because we're no, we're not pleasing to him. But that does not change our love, his love for us. That does not change our acceptance in Christ. This does not change. We are in Christ. We are accepted in Christ. So when a girl understands this, that gives her the kind of security so that she doesn't believe the lies. And of course, we're all working on pleasing God more every day as we live. Um, so, but when we understand the truth, then we don't need to think the lies like, well, I can't do anything right. Well, if we're focused on ourselves, maybe we can't. But Jesus said, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. He who abides in me, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Or another lie about self, just to kind of give some samples. Well, like I'm ugly. Well, the truth is that we are created by God. I will praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. And this my soul knows right well. And so when girls are struggling with these kinds of discouraging thoughts, we need to be careful to give them truth as the answer and not just what sounds good. So in other words, if she's saying, like, I'm ugly, really the answer is not to just be like she needs to start saying, like, I'm beautiful, I'm beautiful. Or if she's feeling like, um, I'm, if she's feeling like I'm not good enough, then the answer is not just for her to be like, I'm successful, you know? Or if she's thinking, like, I can't do this, the answer is not for her to be like, I can do this. Or if she's thinking like, I'm worthless, the answer is not for her to be like, I'm important, or I have important things to say. I mean, those aren't the answers. No, the, in fact, scripture even warns us about that. It says in this verse in Romans, it says, I say to you through the grace given to me to every man among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. And this is just another way that the enemy comes in with his lies. He wants us to think prideful thoughts. Sometimes we don't even recognize those as much because the prideful thoughts are so hard to detect. But they're even just as dangerous, if not more dangerous, than these thoughts that pull us down. So the, the way to help these girls, and this applies to all of us no matter what our age, is not to just be building ourselves up. No, it's to remember who Christ is and who we are in Christ. And so really the answer to this whole issue of wrong thoughts about self, lies about self, would be this, get our eyes off of ourselves and onto Jesus. That is where our security comes from, our encouragement comes from, our joy comes from, our purpose comes from when we have our eyes on him. And when we remember um, this, I like this, yeah, when we remember the gospel, it's not just that um, we are spared from the judgment of God because here is God's judgment, his wrath for sin, and we know that that wrath, instead of falling on us, it fell on Jesus. But really that's only half the gospel. It's also that all the blessings of Christ, his righteousness, that was given to us. That's the great exchange of 2 Corinthians 5.21, that God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And so when we remember the truth, we remember we're redeemed, we're forgiven, we're loved, we are children of God, we are adopted, we're set free, we belong to him, we are co-heirs with Jesus Christ, we are a part of his bride. And when those are the things that we're speaking to ourselves, you know, if all day long we're saying to ourselves, I'm worthless, I can't do anything right, everything's going downhill, I'm a failure, then we're not remembering the truth about what God has said about us, his children, that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. But if we are going through the day remembering, behold, the man, what manner of love the Father has given to me that I'm called the child of God. Like if we are remembering that position, think of how that is going to change our outlook and our perspective throughout the day. So there's lots of different areas that I think we should be really discerning of lies. So um, just to kind of like mention a few of them without really discussing them here, there's a chapter in my book about emotions. 
And emotions is a hard, hard area for us, right? Um, but we need to be discern lies, lies like this one. I can't control my emotions or I can't help the way I respond when I feel this way. Or lies about sin and temptations, like, well, this sin is so small, it doesn't matter. Or, I can keep my sin under control. Or other Christians are doing it, so it must be okay. Or the only person I'm really hurting is me. So many lies. No one's going to know that Satan comes in and brings lies that lead to temptation. Or lies about purity. You know, purity is too difficult. It's not worth waiting. It's okay to date a non-believer. I can take matters into my own hands and so many more that we could list, that we need to be vigilant to guard against the lies of the enemy. You know, if there's one area that the enemy is probably used to bring heartache and destruction um, and, and just misery in the lives of Christian young people, it's the area of moral temptation. The enemy attacks so hard and there's so many young people and they had so much potential for the Lord and this is the area that they fell. And it started, I think, because of lies they were believing. That's where the enemy starts. That's where, you know, it's, he starts with attacking our mind. Um, a couple years ago, I was in Oklahoma City. I was visiting someone, and a couple friends and I, we were just walking um, along the sidewalk uh, on our way to visit this friend. And all of a sudden, I heard my friends saying, Sarah, watch out. And I turned around and I looked at them and they were both looking at me and they had this look of panic on their faces. And the first thought that went through my mind was that I was about to be hit by a car. And so I turned around and then I felt something touch my shoulder, but it wasn't something that hurt at all. It just sort of brushed my shoulder. And then I realized exactly what was happening. I was standing underneath a gate arm, like a gate that lets cars in and out of a parking lot um, like this. So I was standing right underneath it and it had come down right on my head. And so my friends were looking from a distance and so that's why, I mean, they were just like a little bit away. That's why they were so alarmed and they were so scared, but it did, actually didn't hit my head. It just brushed my shoulder and it didn't hurt me at all. I was totally fine. And my friends, they were like really shaken up. Are you okay? And then as we were walking along, we were all being like a lot more careful, like looking where we were going. So when I got back, home to Iowa, um, I was talking to my brother Stephen and I was just like telling him about my time and my experience in Oklahoma City and then I happened to mention this inc incident that had happened. And then Stephen said to me, he's like, yeah, did you know that people have been paralyzed by those and even killed by those? And I said, no. And he said, I always wondered how that could happen, like how someone could like walk under it and not even see it. Well, I guess I know how it can happen now. <laughs> it happens when somebody is not paying attention, who's talking to their friends. And, you know, the worst kind of danger to be in is when you don't know you're in danger. Because you're not, you're just, just walking along, not knowing that there's any danger. And um, Satan doesn't announce his coming. You know, Satan's not like, watch out, I'm about to get you. No, he tries to catch us by surprise. He's like a prowl, prowling lion, right? And he wants to catch us by surprise. And so he is bringing, he's gonna bring attack and temptations and lies against us. And he tries to make them subtle. And so he wants, like in this area of purity, you know, he wants girls to think. He wants them to think, you know what? It is too late for you because of your past mistakes. He wants them to think, you know what? There's no godly guys anymore, so it's not worth waiting. He wants them to think, you know what? No guy's gonna even want you anyway. He wants them to think, you know what? If you follow God's way, it's not going to work. You're going to be single your whole life. If you follow God's way, you're going to end up miserable and lonely. God's ways are old-fashioned. They don't work anymore. These are lies. I mean, it's like when I'm talking to girls, I just want to like stand up and shout. These are lies spoken up by an enemy who hates you. He wants to see your life destroyed. Why would we listen to his a lies of an enemy who wants to destroy us? And Jesus, on the other hand, he loves us. He loves us so much. He has such great things in store for those who follow him. How great is his goodness, Psalm 31. How great is your goodness that you have stored up for those who fear you. 
And so that's why it's so important that we guard against, you know, if, if girls are believing these lies, they are in a lot more danger than they are if a gate arm is about to come down on their head. Because it, that's only going to hurt them physically. But these lies of Satan can destroy our soul. And so that's why it's so important to guard against the lies. Don't dwell on them. Don't play around with them. Don't think, oh, I can just believe the lie. It's not going to lead me to a wrong decision. No. Those lies take us right down the wrong path that Satan wants us to go on. So, in, as we kind of just have a few minutes left in this session, um, what I really want to challenge all of us in is the answer is not to go through and try to identify every lie of Satan. That would be impossible. I mean, the answer is just to keep getting to know God's Word better and better. And, you know, just be building our life on God's Word. Um, when I think of someone who's just filled their life with God's Word, one person that comes to mind is a guy named uh, Mr. George Blevins, and some of you might even know him, but his, um, he's recently gone to be with the Lord. But um, his daughter, Laura, comes to our assembly, and she would sometimes bring her father, her elderly father, with her. And um, I remember one Sunday, we'd had a church dinner, and we were all cleaning up, and he, Mr. Blevins, was sitting over by himself just on a chair in the other side of the basement, and he was doing what he always loved to do, preach. And I don't think he knew that no one was listening to him because he was older and he was struggling with dementia. So he was just preaching. He was just saying, he who has the son has life. He who does not have the son does not have life. Just filling the basement with these wonderful words of truth. And Laura said, you know, I think the reason that God is keeping my dad alive, because I think he was in his 90s at that time already, um, she said, it's just because God is still using him even in his, with his failing mind. And she said, you know, my dad wakes up in the morning and he prays and says, Lord, help me to be the man that you want me to be today. And she's like, I don't even, you know, know if he understands, or I don't even know if he understood like what he was saying, you know? And um, Laura said that she would take her dad sometimes to an elderly daycare place where they would like plan activities for the elderly people. And the staff who worked there, they would say to Laura, your dad just preaches all day long. He's trying to get everybody here saved. And he preaches the same message every day. But the thing is, all the other elderly people, they didn't have that good of memories either. So it was like they got to hear the message new every day. And he was, as he was preaching his same message every day, his favorite verse is, he who has the son has life. He who does not have the son does not have life. And what a mission field God gave him in his old age. But you know, and then the Lord did take him home just recently. And his funeral was a really neat testimony of a life lived for Christ. But, you know, if we're ever in that condition, don't we want it to be that it's scripture that's coming out of our mouth? I mean, I know I would want that. And I also know that does not happen by accident. That is the result of a life spent in God's word. You know, I think of this verse um, in Psalms again. Blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. And he's like a tree planted by streams of water that brings forth his fruit in season, doesn't wither, whatever he does will prosper. You know, that phrase, whatever he does will prosper, and it's similar to this one in Joshua 1.8 about how we'll, if we are like meditating on God's word and obeying it, we're going to be prosperous and successful. And of course, this is talking about true success and prosperity, not worldly success and prosperity. But I mean, just think, what college could guarantee you that if you graduate from their school, you are gonna be successful in everything you do. Like that would be an absolute joke. And yet think about the time, the money spent for a college education. And if we would spend that same effort, that time in God's word, I mean, how much more valuable is God's word than the college education from the best school in the world? I mean, prosper, that everything we do is going to be prosperous and successful? I mean, just like the amazing promises in God's word for the one who meditates on it. I remember a friend when she was in high school, um, she memorized a lot of scripture, like whole books of the New Testament. She was a few years older than I was and I really looked up to her. And then she went to a Christian college, it was a prestigious Christian school really, and she um, had a good experience there. And then she ended up on the mission field, she got married, and one time she was back um, on furlough visiting, and she made a comment to me that really stood out to me. She said, you know, that, call, that scripture I memorized in high school is more valuable to me now than my entire college experience. 
And wow, I think a lot of people would be shocked by that statement. That scripture she memorized is more valuable than her entire college experience. I mean, think of how many thousands of dollars were poured into that college, you know? And I'm not, not saying anything against college. What I'm saying is how much more valuable is God's word? And are we memorizing it and meditating on it? You know, both of these two verses that I just uh, had up here talk about meditation on scripture. And I remember as I was growing up and reading these verses and I heard messages about them, like just kind of wondering like, why does it specifically say that the one who meditates on God's word is gonna be prosperous, like get these special blessings that come. Again, we're talking about spiritual prosperity and success, not worldly. Um, but why, why meditation? Like I just was kind of like, it sounds like kind of like a magic formula, like what we have to do is just meditate on God's word and then there's these blessings. Well, one day it really clicked for me and it really clicked when I started realizing how what I think about so affects my emotions and how my emotions are what really affect my attitudes and then, of course, my emotions and attitudes will affect my actions. And, of course, my actions would affect my day and then my life. And so when I started realizing, like, what I choose to think about, like, just on a given day, if I'm thinking, oh, this is, I'm never going to get everything done today. This problem is never going to go away. This person is being really un inconsiderate. There's, this problem is just getting worse and worse. There's no answer. You know, if I'm just thinking those kinds of thoughts, well, what does that do to my emotions and my attitudes? It pulls me down. It just sort of sets the pace for my whole day. On the other hand, if on that same day, if I think, you know what? Jesus is on the throne today. My life is hid with Christ in God. In everything, give thanks for this is God's will for me in Christ Jesus. If I just choose to think those things and meditate on those scriptures, wow, does that change my emotions, my attitudes, my actions, my day, my life. All starting with what I'm choosing to think about. And when that just clicked for me, I realized, wow, I get it. I get it why we need to meditate on God's word day and night. It truly does affect every area of our life. Just like scripture says, Proverbs 4.23, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And of course, we need to make the distinction that we're talking about. God's version of meditation is thinking about scripture, not the world's way of meditation, which is... Often, often the world say, when the world says meditation, um, they're often talking about like emptying your mind or bypassing your mind or clearing your mind. They'll say things like find your inner peace and look into yourself. So that's actually the opposite of, of biblical meditation. That is linked with um, the occult often, with other religions. It's actually very dangerous. It's actually opening up your mind uh, to dangerous influences. And it's the opposite because scripture meditation is actually to fill your mind with scripture. That's what it means. It's to think. It doesn't mean to not think. It means to think. Think about God's word. And that's what we want to do day and night. And when we do that, we're going to be like a tree bringing forth fruit and we're going to recognize lies of the enemy. Um, I remember one year at Christmas, I was, oh, it was like eight years ago or something, um, just kind of having a harder season because of a specific incident that was discouraging me. And I was reading the story of Mary, the mother of Jesus, and how when she heard that she was going to be the mother of the Messiah, she said, behold, I'm the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And I thought, you know, that's the response I want to have right now. Because it wasn't an easy thing Mary was called to, even though it was a really high blessing. I mean, there's going to be a lot of difficulties that Mary was going to face. But she said, I'm the servant of the Lord. And I thought, that's the response I want to have right now with this situation that's really just discouraging me and really hard for me. And so I just said, Lord, I just want to, I'm just going to remember that phrase. So whenever I would start feeling discouraged or sad or confused about the situation, I would just say, behold, I'm the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. So I just was quoting it. And I mean, I was quoting it a lot because especially for like a couple weeks in there, I was really like distracted by the situation. And you know, it's like that verse kind of started to become a part of me. And now whenever I read that verse, I always think about that time. But I mean, I don't think of it as a bad time. It was a good time. God was working in my life, even if it was a hard time. And I think that's kind of the idea when it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. 
Like as we think about God's word and we pray God's word and we meditate on God's word, it's like it, it starts to become part of us, it starts to be engrafted in us. And um, again, when we are abiding in Christ and in his word, that is what keeps us on the right path. And that's what keeps us from the lies of the enemy. And it, it enables us to recognize those lies. And um, one last comment is just that I encourage moms and daughters to talk about these things together. I know that that is kind of awkward sometimes for moms and daughters, but like if you, if you do go through one of our resources like this book, Speak Truth in Your Heart or something, um, or, what, or just talking about the conference or whatever, I encourage you, like we all need help and accountability in this area. And a lot of times moms can help daughters to identify lies and to work through them. And um, so I encourage you to don't just end here, but you know, keep thinking about these things and discussing them and hopefully as moms and daughters discuss them. So um, thank you very much. And I think that someone's gonna come up and close in prayer for us.